Cool. Uh, so just before I get started, I'm pretty pumped up. Uh, like I said, I have 120 slides in 40 minutes, kind of a big risk for me. But I know you guys are young, you're smart, and you have no attention span, so I hope the, the fit's going to be good. And then second thing is uh, I love to be challenged. Uh, I'm a marketeer, so sometimes marketeers say a lot of bullshit. So if you don't agree with what I'm saying, you can come and insult me after the talk. No problem. I'll be there, and then I'll be right over there. Third thing is let's get started. Um, oh, wait. I need slides. Yes, I need slides. I have to press on uh, black. The green? Yes. Yes. I could do it without slides, too, but it's less interesting. Yay! Okay, so 40-minute power session about growth, growth hacking, growth marketing. First of all, a little bit about what we do at the Growth Tribe Academy. Uh, we're uh, obsessed with education, and we have a model. We've built Europe's first growth hacking academy. What we basically do is uh, we take a team of three people, and we ramp up their skills. So we take a coder, a hustler, and a hipster. So a creative, an analytical person, and uh, a marketeer. And we put them together into a high growth startup so that that startup can grow even faster. So this example, for example, this is Eric from Miami, Karina from uh, Switzerland, and Tijo from uh, the Netherlands. We put them together as a growth team inside a high growth startup to help that startup grow even faster. This is another example. This is at Van de Bron. They're a clean uh, tech uh, energy company. Same thing. We put them in the company, we teach them for a week, we coach them on a regular basis, and we help this company grow even faster. Just a little note, at Growth Tribe, we absolutely love young creators. Uh, I think 40% of the people from our first academy uh, had one touch point with the uh, young creators, and I think it's about 35% from our second academy also have a touch point with young creators. They're either part of the young creators group or they came to one of the young creators meetup where we talked. So my goal here is to recruit some of you, basically. And that's my sales pitch. But I'll leave the sales for the last two slides, if I have time. Other thing that we do is we also help sort of marketing managers, marketing executives, investors, founders to ramp up on their skills, on their growth skills, their technical marketing skills. And we're now starting to do this at corporates as well with corporate innovation programs and digital innovation programs. We've worked with a lot of different types of companies, like big companies, small companies, corporates, in different industries, the health industry, legal industry, any industry, you name it. And we've kind of found a model on how to train people, how to build growth teams, how to, and how to uh, implement a growth hacking process within a company that's been quite successful and is more, more and more successful at the moment. So growth is more about the mindset other than anything else so now i want to jump into the brain of the growth hacker or the growth marketeer or the technical marketeer or whatever you want to call it so let's jump into his brain so does anybody know who this guy is if anybody knows who it is you're amazing nobody now now that i have his name anybody no? Okay, so this is Takeru Kobayashi. He's 65 kilos, he's from Japan, and he's the world international two times record holder of the uh, Coney Island hot dog eating contest. So this guy, the first time he participated in the Coney Island hot dog eating contest, he gobbled down 52 hot dogs in 20 minutes. The record was at 25 hot dogs. He more than doubled the record. And he was up against guys like this, okay? <coughs> world champion, two times world record. How did he do this? In my opinion, this guy's a growth hacker for a number of reasons. So he sat in his apartment in Tokyo and he practiced for six months. He experimented for six months. And what he found was that everybody was just eating the whole hot dog and chugging it down. He did two things. First of all, he separated the sausages from the bread. So he would eat like eight sausages. And then, second thing, he found a legal loophole. You were allowed to have any type of liquid during the contest. So he would dunk the bread into water so he didn't have to chew it. And he would just sort of gobble it down. Um, you can check it out on YouTube. It's disgusting. But basically, um, he, he did this growth hack, right? He, he experimented, he found this technique that nobody else was using. He was champion the first time, champion the second time. And the third time, everybody started copying him, and then the hack didn't work anymore. So one of the things about these hacks is they only work for a certain time. They're not sustainable. Building an amazing product is probably the only sustainable way to grow. So basically, if you guys are growing a company or product right now, you better learn to eat hot dogs fast, right? Because there's a lot of competition out there. And I'll tell you about that in a few uh, seconds. So you guys know Udemy? 
Everybody here sh should know Udemy, right? It's like the f one of the fastest growing online learning platforms in the world. I think they have like 40,000 online learning videos, something like that. It's a marketplace. If you're building a marketplace, twice the fun. You've got demand and you've got supply. This is what Udemy looked like in the early days. No teachers would come because there were no students. No students would come because there were no teachers. So what did they do? They didn't do big marketing campaigns. They didn't hire a great marketeer, etc. They did a little hack. They asked themselves, where is our target audience hanging out right now? And the answer was YouTube. So they basically built a little scraper that would scrape the meta information off of YouTube, and they hacked the supply side of their website. They had something like 10,000 courses from YouTube on their platform. So then the students started coming. Once the students were there, they could build their own content. This is how they sort of growth hacked the very beginning. A lot of people know the PayPal example. PayPal wanted, was convinced that people would share money over email. The bankers laughed in their face. Then they did some marketing campaigns, but it was too expensive. So what they did is they started paying people to become uh, users of PayPal. So uh, if you created an account, you would get $10, and everybody who you invited would also get $10. It cost $20 uh, to acquire each customer. That's the famous story. The least famous story is that by analyzing the data, they found some irregularities in their data, and they identified that their early adopters were actually eBay power sellers, but eBay power sellers didn't really know about PayPal so much. So what did they do? They created a bot that would go around eBay just buying products from eBay power sellers and requesting to pay with PayPal. So they were artificially engineering a pain with these eBay power sellers so that these eBay powers were like, well, fucking hell, I, I need to get PayPal because these people are buying with PayPal. And then they had this huge warehouse full of products which they then sold back on eBay and even made a profit on some of the, uh, on some of the products, or so the story goes. There's tons of other examples. This is what I call like startup porn or business porn. We think that Airbnb grew just because of this great uh, growth hack. I'm not going to get into the details of these stories, but a lot of, a lot of these companies have a, a little bit of these stories in the beginning to put that initial petrol on the fire. Um, what do these have in common? So we're always looking for patterns in data, in stories, in use cases. They have three things in common. The first thing is other people's network. Your target audience is already hanging out on other people's websites, other people's platforms, other people's, uh, using other people's APIs, for example. What are those platforms and how can you piggyback off of the success of those other platforms? The second thing is that they're creative or sneaky. So when I'm sitting with legal departments, we call it sneaky. When I'm sitting with you guys, we call it creative. We'll play a little ethics game in a little bit. That's going to be fun. And then it's more than just marketing. And I'll get into the details of that in a little bit. So <clears throat> why is growth hacking taking over the world? number of reasons. First reason is uh, traditional marketing channels are extremely expensive and saturated. So I'm not just talking about like above the fold marketing like TV, radio, uh, stuff like that. All forms of marketing are becoming extremely expensive and saturated. Paid acquisition is really expensive. This is the average US online spend to acquire one loyal user. It's an average so it's a lie but you can see that the number keeps going up. Most projects focus too heavily on building cool stuff that nobody wants, right? But everybody's just building features, building, building, building. And don't trust my word for it. So you have Steve Blank, who's like the godfather of Lean Startup. And you have Peter Thiel, the founder of PayPal, part of the PayPal Mafia in the Silicon Valley. And then you have Steve Blank, uh, the founder of 500 Startups. They believe that your riskiest assumption is not building a cool product. It's actually distribution. It's actually targeting the right audience at the right cost. That's becoming more and more complicated. The first reason, we're bombarded with ads on a daily basis. So uh, we're bombarded with 250 to 3,000 ads on a daily basis. Nobody cares about my new product. Nobody cares about my new app. It's just a little blip in their lives. Second reason, you guys know Betalist.com? It's a bunch of websites that are up and coming. It's, hand, it's curated by the guys at Betalist. These are the number, this is the number of new uh, curated uh, beta uh, websites and startups that are coming up on a weekly basis. Everybody's here has got a good landing page, they've got some ad spend, they're trying to tap into the same audience as you. It's super competitive. Why? Well, because the marginal costs of building a, a, a product or a startup are so low nowadays with like Amazon web servers and with all these coding frameworks that we have. There's 110 million developers out there. So this is a guy who signed up to our second academy. He's 15. He's a PHP developer. He's already built three startups. This guy's building cool stuff. This guy's fighting against all of us to grab people's attention. This guy's you guys, basically. 
So that's the bad news. We're all fucked. But the good news is, is that don't worry because people are completely addicted to the virtual world and there's so many new channels that are popping up. So I took this picture uh, six months ago at the London City Airport. And this is lunchtime, so you're supposed to be enjoying your meal, reading the newspaper, or talking to people next to you. Everybody's on a freaking screen. So he's on a screen, they're talking on a screen, he's in front of them, he's on a screen as well, she's on a screen. There's one ordering food on a screen in the back, he's on a screen, she's on two screens, and they're on screens as well. So the good news is, is people are addicted to the virtual world, and with VR coming up and stuff, being in front of a computer is gonna, being in front of a screen is gonna become much more fun, so we'll probably be even more addicted. So a lot more opportunities for sleazy marketeers to get touch points with their customers. This is a slide I stole from uh, James Courier. It shows you the ef viral effectiveness of channels over time. So it used to be we didn't have that many channels to grow or to grow virally. It used to be like email or word of mouth with a, was a big thing. And then that sort of died. So you see these channels, they come and they go. But what we see is that the number of channels is increasing exponentially. So there's more and more channels that are growing, which is wonderful because there's so many new opportunities for us to grow. So just one example, Snapchat, 100 million active users, only 1% of marketeers on this channel. Marketeers aren't really tapping into it, but it's a platform that probably has a lot of inefficiencies, a lot of potential there, a lot of traffic, and it's still quite cheap. But there's so much more than that. There's all these weird social media uh, platforms that we've never heard of or heard of only for like six months, like Beam Social, and also start thinking about new technologies like wearable technology, um, could be like self-driving cars, for example, virtual reality, I think is going to be huge, uh, augmented reality, robotics. There's just so many platforms that I usually say nobody has a customer acquisition problem. It's not possible. Just with all of the potential to tap into your audience right now, there's no excuse not to grab some acquisition. Yeah, like the robotic open, soft, uh, open uh, uh, operating system, for example. Just think about technologies, APIs, and social media platforms. They're exploding. So the thing is, that was acquisition, right? How to grab new users. That stuff's easy. That's like growth for babies. What's hard is this stuff, activation and retention. So this is stats from Quetra. This is every single app, well, over 100,000 apps on the Google Play Store. This is retention rates at 90 days. As you can see, after three days, the average retention rate is already under 20%. So, <clears throat> and after 90 days, your average retention rate over all apps combined is more around like 3 or 4%. So acquisition is not actually the problem. Registered users is easy. What's hard is retain users, weekly active users, daily active users, users that have had a great first user experience or have, have seen the wow moment of your app or your product. And then finally, well, no, not finally. Number five, we have so much data available that basically everything's about return on investment now. So the days of this guy are long gone. So the sexy marketeer in the Madison Avenue sort of agency being sexist and smoking cigarettes, coming up with great copywriting, that doesn't work anymore. We've replaced that with attribution models, with, with finding out exactly what's working, which channels are attracting the best users that are being the most retained, that are delivering the most money for my company, my app, or my product. And finally, it's what I was saying before, so it's not about the tips and the tricks, so stuff that has worked for others will not work for you. There's a lot of these blog posts out there, like 100 content marketing strategies you should follow, the 200 best growth hacks. The thing is, you have a different value proposition, you have a different customer journey, you have a different price point, you have a different branding, a different culture, so what worked for others isn't gonna work for you. But what we found is that by developing a process, by following a process, we're capable of finding these growth hacks 90% of the time. Uh, by the way, if you hate the term growth hack, I'm really sorry, but it just it converts so well when we do advertising that I use it all the time. So there's no magic potion, you need a process, so I'm going to put my consulting hat on right now. Um, what we usually do is we dive into the data, we use something called the pirate funnel. I'm pretty sure most of you have heard of the pirate funnel, we'll jump into it in a little bit. Then we create a more elaborate pirate funnel, which is called a flow chart, so it's basically the whole flow of a user within your app. And then we use something called the OMTM. So at every point of development of your app, your product, your service, whatever, there's only like one metric that really matters that you should focus your whole company on. So what we've seen is that the, the scarcest resource of startups, of projects, is time. The only way to thwart that problem is to focus only on one or two metrics and to have the whole company working on one or two metrics, improving that metric. It could be weekly active users, it could be profit margins, it could be activation, it could be whatever you want, but try to focus only on one or two metrics. Um, there's a book called Lean Analytics. 
Has anybody read this thing? You raise your hand. One person, two people, three people. Okay, like five people. I think it's the best business book I've ever read. And it's really easy to read, so you only need to read the first 50 pages. Then in the middle, you can just choose your business model. It has all the business models, and then you don't even need to read the end. So just read the first 50 pages and then the middle. Um, just do it. I know you're not going to do it, but you know, do it anyway. <laughs> um, and then so we determine this one metric that matters, and then we stole everything from the lean startup. So we create an, and also from uh, Agile Scrum. So we create an idea backlog on how to improve this OMTM. So it's a long list of all of the ideas that we have. Then we prioritize these ideas using a bunch of spreadsheets. Um, then we design an experiment. So Vout's doing uh, something about experiment design over in that room. Maybe you should go talk to him. We, we, we design what's the fastest way to know if this strategy is going to work or not. And we time box experiments in two weeks mas maximum. So in two weeks, we need to know if this thing's going to work or not. Then we execute. This is the difference between startups or products that are successful and those that aren't. And that's why we're so obsessed with education. We teach people the skills on how to execute faster. And then we analyze the learnings. It failed, why did it fail? It succeeded, why did it succeed? And then we start again and again and again. So this looks beautiful, uh, but this is usually what happens. So we do it the first time and we fail miserably. Like, of course, the experiment didn't work out, our ideas suck. And then we do it again. A second time, it fails again. A third time, it fails again. A fourth time, it fails again. And then we have like this little glimpse of hope on the fifth time that, ooh, it actually worked a little bit because we got all these learnings, the unknown unknowns from the previous experiments. And after like maybe 10 experiments or 12 experiments, we get this greedy little growth hack, this thing, this little secret that we keep, what we call like a playbook, and that works. And that really can help a company grow <coughs> for a certain amount of time. So what is this growth hacking thing? Uh, I'm going to go into a detailed explanation of it and give you some examples on each part of the detail. So basically, this is the definition. It's from some guy on the internet. I still can't find the source. If you guys know, please let me know. It's a small team of data-driven technical people whose sole goal is to help scale the business. So what does that mean? And what does it encompass? So it's this thing. And I'm going to break this down step by step. So first of all, we have creative marketing, and creative, sometimes sneaky marketing. But I'll show you that the sneaky stuff, we shouldn't obsess about it too much. Um, this is usually how we, when we analyze uh, uh, the tricks that we do, we see that we're 20% subversive, 30% cutting edge, it's usually a lot of tech and quant, and then 50% best practices. So let's look at the sort of subversive stuff. We're going to play the ethics game. So. You, you're going to ask yourself in your brain, was this technique smart or was it sneaky? Um, and I hope I'm not insulting anybody in the room who's linked to any of these companies. So smart is like cheeky, acceptable, something that's bending the rules, but it's cool because you have no money anyway. And then cheeky is something that's like downright terrible and something you wouldn't be proud to tell your grandmother about, for example. So, do you guys remember Ashley Madison? It's a dating website for married couples so that they can like, you know, have sex on the side. Um, it's a, it's a, a dating website, so it's a marketplace. Unfortunately, that means that the supply is the women and the demand is the men. So how did they hack the supply side? Well, they created tens of thousands of fake profiles on Ashley Madison, so that it looked, of women profile on Ashley Madison, so it looked like it was a pool of just women that you could hit on. Uh, and the numbers vary between 70% to 95% of the profiles on Ashley Madison were fake. At some point, some article said that it was 1.2 million men talking to 1,500 fake, uh, real women, and the rest were fembots. So smart or sneaky? There's no right answer. It's probably sneaky, but um, just make your own sort of opinion. MySpace, yeah, MySpace got a hold of 100 million emails, and they blasted emails to 100 million people. That was in the early days, and then they become this fluffy, beautiful company that we loved. But that was one of their tactics in the early days. Smart or sneaky? Glide, anybody know Glide? Remember Glide? Yeah? So it's like SMS video, so it's uh, SMS in a video format, so instead of sending you text, I send you a video. What they did is, when you signed up, they asked you to import your contacts so that you could send an, a video SMS to your contacts. What they didn't tell you is that they were going to send an invitation to every single one of the contacts that you uh, uploaded. Smart or sneaky? 
Salesforce, this is a really nice story. So Mark Benioff, famously, there was the conference of his biggest competitor. He hired like 150 fake protesters to go protest outside of the conference. And then he hired a bunch of taxi drivers who were taking people from the airport to the conference for them to pitch Salesforce to the clients that were being taken to the conference. Smart or sneaky? Uh, Oracle, this is just a cute one. The first version of Oracle software, I can't remember which software it was, they didn't name it V1, they called it V2 because V2 is more reassuring than V1. This one, Uber, this one is, this is like also what I call like business porn. This was in TechCrunch. So Uber employees uh, ordered 5,500 uh, rides from uh, Lyft and then they canceled them, creating a lot of fuss uh, within Lyft. Uh, they did another thing is uh, they actually carried out, uh, ah, I can't remember the second part, but what happened in India recently, this was I think in TechCrunch or something, apparently Ola did the same thing to Uber in India but on a totally different level, they did it with 400,000 uh, rides. So. Uh, yeah, these stories, they're really cute, they're really smart, they make me look clever, all this stuff. You shouldn't concentrate on this subversive stuff. It's usually not scalable. It can really hurt your brand, hurt your image. Maybe do it in the early stage, but not as you grow. Like you start being a hacker and then you end up being a mission-driven startup like Airbnb. But just doing the best practices and the cutting edge stuff is usually enough because we see that 95% of companies don't even do the cutting edge or the best practice stuff. So that was the creative marketing part. Then we have coding and automation. And when you combine creative marketing and coding and automation, you have something beautiful, which is like technical marketing. Usually what we do is we just say, put some devs, put some engineers with the marketing team, and they will create magic. <clears throat> we believe that tomorrow's marketeer or today's marketeer should have a basic technical skill set. Uh, here it is. Uh, an understanding of APIs, know how to do some database querying, and just know basic HTML, JavaScript, and uh, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, but there's also a lot of tools out there that enable you not to need to know how to code, and we use a lot of these tools. So let me give you an example. Imagine that you are an on-demand printing company, and you're targeting fashion publishers, right? People who, fashion pu uh, who publish fashion magazines. As a marketeer, you would do some PR, you would maybe find some sales leads, you would do some marketing campaigns on Facebook or whatever. As more of a technical marketeer, something that you could do is find this website where everybody's publishing their magazines uh, for them to be bought directly on the website. And if you analyze the website a little bit, you could see that these companies are actually sharing uh, their domain name on each of these pages. And if you use a tool, you don't even have to use Python for this. If you use a tool, you can scrape this in like 30, 40 minutes so that you have this beautiful spreadsheet of every single fashion publisher and every single website linked to that fashion publisher. Then you do another thing. You use a tool called uh, Clearbit, and Clearbit gives you rich information based on domain names. So it gives you like the LinkedIn of that company, sometimes the email, the Twitter, uh, and other rich social information. Then you use another tool called Email Hunter, which 70% of the time is able to guess the email of people within that company based on the domain name. You put everything together in another tool called Blockspring. Blockspring basically uh, enables you to merge all of these APIs together. And then you have basically in two days for 30 euros, unlimited leads, unlimited leads. Um, so whereas somebody might do a whole campaign, you can create these cool little playbooks, uh, mixing uh, all of these tools together. By the way, we have a little meeting in our company called What's Working Now? Blockspring is what's working now. Blockspring.com, amazing tool. <clears throat> so how do you come up with these tricks? It doesn't come up overnight, it's really through experimentation. And it's through analyzing data and testing as much as possible. So the data and testing part. We have an experiment-based approach to marketing, to acquisition, to retention, etc. It used to be you do a big marketing campaign and you see what happens. See you in seven months, let's see if it worked or not. Now we work with these experiment sheets. So we believe that this is going to work. To verify that, we will design this experiment. And let's check in two weeks to see if our metrics are proving it or not. And we just drown in these experiment sheets, basically. And so, <clears throat> how do we validate that something worked or not? We used hard data, of course, so this is really basic. It's just a conversion funnel on Mixpanel. We use retention charts to find out if people are actually coming back based on which cohort. And then we can take it a bit further when we have a good data scientist or when we run some regression analysis. We can calculate customer lifetime values per segment, for example. Or there's a guy called Alex in our last academy who basically created a model where he could do behavioral predictive analysis based on how people were acting on the website. I never understand what Alex is talking about, but he gave me this slide. 
Um, no joke. Uh, and then finally, you have the behavioral psychology. We believe that we're like mind readers. So there's two ways to become a mind reader. The first one is to analyze soft data, talk to your users. Talking to your users always works. You find out so much from talking to users. You come up with better hypothesis on what's going to work. There's also usability testing, running in-house usability tests, uh, in-app in uh, surveys, for example, using a tool like Intercom to talk to your users all the time. And then finally, stuff like looking at flowcharts and click maps and heat maps and user recording videos. Anybody using Hotjar here? Tool Hotjar? OK. Just check it out, hotjar.com. It's got a lot of this stuff built into one tool. So the hard data tells us what's happening. The soft data tells us why it's happening. Why did that experiment fail? Why am I doing wrong? Why is my value proposition incorrect? Why are people not coming back? If you're interested in behavioral psychology and how to manipulate people, there's these three books. They teach you about the cognitive biases that humans have and how you can influence them more effectively. So, and then when you mix data testing and behavioral psychology together, you get a beautiful thing called conversion rate optimization, and this is all the beautiful A-B tests that you read about on the internet. So I've got two for you. Um, so this is an example of a clean tech energy company. <clears> the <throat> first version of their landing page uh, had been created by an agency. Two months of brainstorming in a room, and it's this, and it's this, and mood, mood boards, and all that stuff. And then our team, what they did is they came up with a new landing page, coded it based on soft data that they had from talking to users and hard data from looking at the website, and they coded a website, uh, a landing page in like three hours. They put the website up, they did an A-B test, and we got a 30% increase in signups. And this was in like two, three hours, right? And what I'm asking you is how much money did it cost to hire that design agency that was all based on sort of fluff. And how much money is the increase in revenue? How, how much are we reducing customer acquisition costs just with this small experiment? So this is another sort of bragging one. So this is a beautiful uh, company that helps uh, terminally ill people have access to, uh, to uh, medicine that's not on the market yet. This was the first version of the landing page. We used all of the techniques that I talked about to create the second version. Second version is actually not as sexy, there's not as much color, but we're using the soft data that we collected, the hard data that we collected, and we're concentrating on the right USPs, and then we were able to get like a 732% increase on signups just by being more clear, okay? On, on a statistically significant sample size. So this is like growth hacking porn, it's showing a B-test, 732% increase, but that's not exactly where the real power is, and I'll show you the real power in a few seconds. But first, I want to talk about what's the difference between growth and marketing. So basically put, you have your pirate funnel. You need to drive people to a website. You need to make sure that they sign up. You need to make sure they have a great experience the first time they come to your product, to your service, or else they'll never come back. You need to make sure that they come back, retention. Hopefully, that they will invite their friends because they love you so much. And then finally, this should actually be at the top, that people will actually start paying for it, or that there's actually a, a predictable uh, business model. So this is less and less true. This used to be super, oh, sorry. This used to be super true. It used to be that marketing was only awareness and acquisition. This is kind of changing. In growth, we believe that our priority is the whole funnel. So we're involved with the whole funnel. We're also involved with features. Which features should we be building? We're also involved with onboarding flows, with UX. So let's go through this step by step. Awareness, if you guys suck at marketing, suck at driving traffic to your website or to your product, get a copy of this book. It's by, has anybody read this? Traction by uh, Justin Mayers? Cool. Um, nobody, basically. Um, it's really simple. Uh, don't read the book, just look at this slide. Um, there's basically 20 customer acquisition channels that exist out there for you to drive traffic to your product, to your service, or to your website. Justin Mayers and, uh, and Ben They've analyzed every single channel, so you have every marketing technique in that book. Really, really well. Encyclopedic research. What we see, though, is that one channel isn't enough. It's usually a combination of channels that work nowadays. So in the insurance world, we worked with some insurance companies. You need to have 12, or 12 to 17 touch points with people before they actually sign up. So you usually need a mix of different channels. And we create these acquisition playbooks, sorry, these awareness acquisition playbooks that are usually a mix, for example, here of social ads plus email marketing plus retargeting plus content marketing. And this is sort of what's working. In order to do this, you need to be one of these T-shaped players that has all these skills, which I'll talk to you about, or be in the right team. If you're interested in this, I don't have time now, but I have a step-by-step -step guide on how you can actually define your best customer acquisition channels. It's at this link up here, so I'll give you like 10 seconds if you want to write it down. And uh, it's really a step-by-step -step guide of what are all the channels, which ones should you choose, how to design an experiment, and how to start testing that channel. 
And if you go to it, you'll also be put on a retargeting pixel, so you'll see us on Facebook for a while. Just being transparent. Second of all, uh, acquisition, getting people to actually sign up to your product or to your website. So there's two reasons. Has anybody seen the BJ Fogg model before? There's only two reasons why people are not clicking your triggers. Triggers are like sign up, give me your credit card information, click on the next step, download the app. So this is where triggers fail. This is where triggers succeed. There's two reasons. I have this tattooed into my brain. There's only two reasons why people don't click on your trigger. First reason is lack of motivation. Second reason is uh, lack of usability, bad usability. So Microsoft did some research a couple years ago. They analyzed like 197,000 websites, and they found that 99% of people will actually leave your website in the first 10 seconds. And if we look a little bit more closely at the graph, we see that after like five seconds, 97% of people are, have already left. So if you guys are like building a product, uh, an app, or website, whatever, you need to convey two things in those first five seconds. People have the attention of goldfish. They have to understand what you're selling, what your value proposition is, and why you're better than the competition. So I'll give you an example and ask yourself, is this a motivation or is it a usability issue? I'll give you one example. This is ShareChat. It's like Dropbox meets Slack. They thought they were conveying their value proposition correctly. We did some five-second tests. People understood the file sharing, but they didn't understand the chat part. And when we asked what's better about this app compared to others, nobody understood. So I put some homework. You guys all have sheets, I think. One of the exercises is a link to this tool. Do some five-second tests on your product or your app or your service. Second reason, uh, and by the way, this book can help you influence the motivation part. So the second reason is ability, bad usability. I'll go through this really fast. There's a book by Steve Krug called Don't Make Me Think. Don't make your users think. When I go to ABN AMRO's page, there's 17 calls to action. I have to read through everything. They're making me think. So much cognitive overhead. I don't know where to click. I'm impatient. I leave. When I go to one of their competitors on the investment side, Wealthfront, there's one button, one value proposition. It's super, super simple. They don't make me think. Activation. I'll go through this. Quite briefly also, basically activation is you need to show wow moments to people on their first visit. So by analyzing data, Zynga found out that if a user came back the next day, one day retention, then there was, much, there was a high correlation with him actually coming back for three months, four months, six months. They only concentrated on that metric. And then there's a lot more of these examples. I think the best one here is maybe the Facebook one. Shamath uh, um, found that if people had seven friends within 10 days, there was a much higher chance that they would come back and be, become addicted to, uh, to Facebook. Put some homework for you. Define what your uh, wow moment is, how many steps it takes to get to the wow moment on your product or your service, and how can you build a new flow where your wow moment is a lot shorter. And I'll give you an example of this. We like to do what's called flipping the wow moment, so don't make people sign up to see the wow moment. Show them the wow moment before. Wealthfront, they're a wealth management uh, startup. They, make you, they show you the wow moment before you actually have to sign up. So in a couple of clicks, in a couple of onboarding steps, you get to this wow moment. So you've got the wow, then they make you sign up. Retention, retention is king at the moment. So there's a bunch of ways to increase retention, building a better product, improving your product, work on your onboarding flow, bringing back dead users with emails. The two that I like the most is reminding your users you exist. So this is just a slide to show you that an app with push notifications in this case had 100% uh, more retention than an app that didn't have push notifications. Just reminding people that you actually exist. And then creating habits through hooks. I don't have time to dive into it. Just read this thing, Hooked by Nirayal. He explains to you how to build habit-forming products, how to build products like Candy Crush or Tinder or uh, Instagram, which are basically crack cocaine. Referrals and also uh, revenue. Also important, but I don't have time today. The point is, what we see in the process is that this is where most startups and companies fail. It's on the execution, because they don't have the right skills inside the team. And that's why we created a training company. We try to create these T-shaped players that are a mix of uh, hacker, hustler, and hipster. The tech, quant, but also creativity. And this is what we do. We believe that these are unicorns, cats riding on unicorns. Basically, they don't exist. They're really hard to find. Most people are like baby unicorns. 
But what's cool is if you put three baby unicorns or four baby unicorns together, you get a growth team. And this is what a growth team looks like. So it's a full stack dev that's not scared to build stuff that breaks. It's a really good UXer that ships fast. It's a data analyst that can make sense of small and large chunks of data. And it's a head of growth that's usually really process driven. And this is what we do in our academy. So sales pitch, of course, for the end. Please join us. We're looking for all of the profiles that I talked to you about. Um, we have a three-month academy. This is probably a really good fit for you guys if you're interested. Really, really good family. We're building a great network. Uh, so you can just check out this slide uh, and sign up to it. We're looking for front-end devs, for UXers, for data scientists, for creative marketeers, all that stuff. And then if you have any questions or stuff like that, just uh, add me on social media and I can answer your questions. Uh, add me on LinkedIn. I'll be super happy, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, thanks a lot for listening. I think we don't do questions. I'm not sure about the format. And uh, I'll just leave the floor. Thank you.